Reminiscences of the Military Life and Sufferings of Colonel Timothy Bigelow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by FNH. Reminiscences of the Military Life and Sufferings of Colonel Timothy Bigelow, Commander of the 15th Regiment of the Massachusetts Line in the Continental Army during the War of the Revolution, by Charles Hersey. 2. Colonel T. Bigelow Lawrence, a great-grandson of the hero of these pages, I dedicate this feeble effort. It is written to perpetuate the memory of one of Worcester's most illustrious sons, and also of his companions in arms, who for eight years struggled so hard to gain the independence of the colonies. Introduction The writer of the following pages was dandled upon the knee of a worthy sire who had spent eight years of his life in the struggle for independence, and taught me the name of Colonel Bigelow, long before I was able to articulate his name. Many have been the times, while sitting on my father's lap around the old hearthstone, now more than fifty years since, that I listened to affecting reminiscences of Colonel Bigelow and others, until his voice would falter, and tears would flow down his aged and careworn face, and then my mother and elder members of the family would laugh and inquire, What is there in all of that that should make you weep? but I always rejoiced with him, and wept when I saw him weep. After the death of my father, having engaged in the active scenes of life, those childish memories in some degree wore away, but the happiest moments of my life have been spent in company with some old revolutionary patriot, while I listened to the recital of their sufferings and their final conquest. The first history of the American Revolution I ever read is found in Morse's Geography, published in 1814. This I read until I had committed the whole to memory. The next was what may be found in Lincoln's History of Worcester, published in 1836, and from which I have taken liberal extracts. The next is the History of the War of Independence of the United States of America, written by Charles Botter, translated from the Italian by George Alexander Otis in 1821. From this also I have taken extracts. I have also consulted Lossing's Pictorial Field Book of the Revolution, in neither of these histories, except Lincoln's, does the name of Colonel Bigelow occur. Therefore I have depended principally upon tradition, coming from his own brethren in arms, and corroborated by history. It has been exceedingly difficult to trace the course and conduct of Colonel Bigelow from any history of the war, but history, aided by tradition, makes up the history of any man. To illustrate, I get the account of Colonel Bigelow's conduct at the Battle of Monmouth, as stated in section 7, from Mr. Solomon Parsons, which I received from his own lips more than forty years ago, and saw in his journal, and more than thirty years since, I heard General Lafayette and Mr. Parsons refer to these scenes, footnote, Lafayette's visit, 1824, the remembrance of which drew tears from each of their eyes, and also from many of the spectators. I find that Mr. Parsons was in Lafayette's detachment, General Green's division, General Glover's brigade, and Colonel Bigelow's regiment, all of this I knew forty years ago from tradition. From history, we all know that General Lafayette and General Green were at that battle, and I am happy to say this whole subject was very recently become an item of history, which may be found on page 260 of Washburn's History of Leicester. In this way, and from such sources, I have gathered the facts embodied in these pages. As to the personal appearance of Colonel Bigelow, I have procured from witnesses who were as well acquainted and familiar with him and his physiognomy as the old residents of this city are with our venerable friend, Governor Lincoln. Some of them are still living. There is one man now living in this city who was thirty years of age when Colonel Bigelow died. This man is a native of Worcester and knew Colonel Bigelow as well as he did any man in town, and heard him speak in the old South Church many times against the Tories. Footnote. Ebenezer Moore, born 1760, October 10. These articles have appeared in the Daily Spy of this city, and at the suggestion of several distinguished individuals who wish to see them in a more durable form for reading and preservation, I have concluded to present them to the public in the following pages. Colonel Timothy Bigelow Chapter 1. A Monument to Colonel Bigelow It is well known in this community that one of the descendants of Colonel Bigelow is about to erect a monument to his memory within the enclosure of our beautiful Central Park. Colonel Timothy Bigelow Lawrence of Boston, a great-grandson of the subject of this notice, received permission from the city government last year 
to enclose a lot of sufficient size and to erect such a monument as he might deem suitable and proper it is understood that colonel lawrence will commence this benevolent and patriotic work in the spring or early summer footnote june 1860 we are happy to say that colonel lawrence has the work now in successful progress let me suggest to him to the mayor and council and to all whom it may concern the propriety of laying the foundation stone of this monument on the nineteenth day of april which will be the eighty-fifth anniversary of the marching of the minutemen from worcester under the command of captain bigelow it seems to me that worcester cannot afford to let this opportunity pass without making some signal recognition of the event cannot the citizens of worcester for the first time in eighty-five years gather with their families around the grave containing the last remains of her noble son chapter two early efforts for liberty the name of timothy bigelow stands conspicuous in the history of worcester as early as seventeen seventy three we find him on a committee with w m young david bancroft samuel curtis and stephen salisbury to report upon the grievances under which the province laboured and also upon what was then called boston pamphlet which had been introduced at the town meeting in march the writer of this article thinks that this boston pamphlet was john hancock's oration in commemoration of the bloody massacre of the fifth of march seventeen seventy at the adjourned meeting in may following this committee made an elaborate report recommending a committee of correspondence the town adopted the report and elected the committee w m young timothy bigelow and john smith in december following the leading whigs of the town assembled and formed a society which afterwards took the name of the american political society and nathan baldwin samuel curtis and timothy bigelow were a chosen committee to report a constitution this society with timothy bigelow for a leader did good service to the town and to the country the last and most powerful blow was struck in the town meeting seventh of march seventeen seventy four when the society presented a long preamble and resolutions which were considered by the royalists to be treasonable and revolutionary when these resolutions were read said an eye-witness of the scene to the writer fear anxiety and awful suspense sat upon the countenance of every man of the whig party except timothy bigelow the blacksmith while the tories were pale with rage after a few moments james putnam the leader of the tories arose putnam was said to be the best lawyer in north america his arguments were marked by strong and clear reasoning logical precision and arrangement and that sound judgments whose conclusions were presented so forcibly as to command assent he made such a speech against the resolutions as had never before been heard in worcester and when he sat down the same informant said that not a man of the whig party thought a single word could be said that old putnam the dory had wiped them all out timothy bigelow at length arose without learning without practice in public speaking without wealth the tories of worcester had at that day most of the wealth and learning but there he stood upon the floor of the old south church met the goliath of the day and vanquished him the governor of massachusetts bay and the crown and parliament of great britain were brought to feel the effect of his sling and stone suffice it to say the resolutions were carried triumphantly this was the first grand public effort made by colonel timothy bigelow in his part of the great drama of the american revolution chapter three the minutemen in august seventeen seventy four a company of minutemen were enrolled under the command of captain bigelow and met each evening after the labours of the day for drill and martial exercise muskets were procured for their arming from boston their services were soon required for the defence of the country at eleven o'clock a m april nineteenth seventeen seventy five an express came to town shouting as he passed through the street at full speed to arms to arms the war is begun the bell rang out the alarm cannons were fired and in a short time the minute men were paraded on the green under the command of captain timothy bigelow after fervent prayer by rev mr mccarty they took up the line of march when they arrived at sudbury intelligence of the retreat of the enemy met them and a second company of minute men from worcester under command of captain benjamin flagg overtook them when both moved on to cambridge the writer cannot forbear to mention a few of the names of these soldiers of freedom most of them have descendants now living and living on the same farms that their illustrious sires or grandsires left when they started with captains bigelow and flagg to repel the enemy at lexington eli chapin was the father of mrs jonathan flagg and mrs captain campbell w m trowbridge was the father of mrs lewis chaplin 
Jonathan Stone, grandfather of Emery Stone, Esquire, who now owns and occupies the same estate. As a Ward, grandfather of W. M. Ward. Simon Gates, father of David R., who now lives on and owns the same estate. David Richards was in Captain Flagg's company, but after he returned, concluding there was going to be hot work, to use his own words forty years afterwards, he turned over to the Tories. The organization of the army was immediately made at Cambridge, and Timothy Bigelow was appointed major in Colonel Jonathan Ward's regiment. In the autumn of 1775, Major Bigelow volunteered his services with his men from Worcester in that expedition against Quebec, alike memorable for its boldness of conception, the chivalrous daring of its execution, and its melancholy failure. During their march from Cambridge to Quebec, Major Bigelow and his noble band endured severe hardships, reduced by hunger to the necessity of eating their camp dogs, and in their last extremity, cutting their boots and shoes from their feet to sustain life. Had that winter march through the wilderness been the exploit of a Grecian phalanx or Roman legion, the narrative of suffering and danger would have been long since celebrated in song and story. One of the three divisions penetrating through the forest by the route of the Kennebec was commanded by Major Bigelow, and during a day's halt of the troops on this memorable march, Major Bigelow ascended a rugged height about forty miles northwest from Norwichwock for the purpose of observation. This eminence still bears the name of Mount Bigelow. In the attack on Quebec on the night of the 31st of December, Major Bigelow was taken prisoner with those of his men who were not killed, and remained in captivity until the summer of 1776. Chapter 4. Major Bigelow a Prisoner We left Major Bigelow a prisoner of war. Whether he was confined in Canada, transported to Halifax, or placed aboard an English prison ship, does not appear on the record. But tradition has it that he went aboard one of those Tory vessels so noted in the history of George the Third. The severe treatment and cruelty he received here did not cool his ardour. His motto was, I have not begun to fight yet. An exchange having been effected in the summer of 1776, after an imprisonment of seven months, he returned and was immediately called into the service with rank of lieutenant colonel, and the next February he was appointed colonel of the 15th Regiment of the Massachusetts Line in the Continental Army. His regiment was composed principally of men from Worcester, though there were some from Leicester, Auburn, Paxton, and Holden, and a braver band never took the field or mustered for battle. High character for courage and discipline, early acquired, was maintained unsullied to the close of their service. His troops being drilled, Colonel Bigelow marched to join the Northern Army, under the command of General Gates, and arrived in season to join the main army at Saratoga, and to assist in the capture of General Burgoyne. At this scene of blood and carnage, Colonel Bigelow, with his regiment from Worcester, behaved with uncommon gallantry. It was said by our informant, who was on the spot at the time, that the 15th Regiment, under the command of Colonel Bigelow, was the most efficient of any on the ground. Colonel Bigelow was of fine personal appearance, his figure was tall and commanding, his bearing was erect and martial, and his step was said to have been one of the most graceful in the army. With taste for military life, he was deeply skilled in the science of war, and the troops under his command and instruction exhibited the highest degree of discipline. Colonel Bigelow possessed a vigorous intellect, an ardent temperament, and a warm and generous heart. Chapter 5. In Pennsylvania. We left Colonel Bigelow with the American army, under the command of General Gates on the banks of the Hudson, exulting over the capture of Burgoyne and the flower of the British army. The next we hear of him, he, with his regiment, together with Colonel Morgan's celebrated rifle corps and one or two other regiments, are ordered to march to the relief of the army in Pennsylvania under the command of General Washington. This campaign in Pennsylvania was very disastrous to the American army. Being poorly clothed and more poorly fed, they were not in condition to meet the tried veterans of the English army. It was said of this reinforcement from General Gates' army that they were men of approved courage and flushed with recent victory but squalid in their appearance from fatigue and want of necessaries. But when Colonel Bigelow led his regiment into line with the main army at White Marsh, a small place about fourteen miles from Philadelphia, he was recognised by the commander-in-chief as the very identical Captain Bigelow whom he had seen at Cambridge with a company of Minutemen from Worcester, and while Washington held Colonel Bigelow by the hand to introduce him to his brother officers, he said, This, gentlemen officers, 
is Colonel Bigelow and the 15th Regiment of the Massachusetts Line under his command. This gentleman is the man who vanquished the former Royalists in his own native town. He marched the first company of Minutemen from Worcester at the alarm from Lexington. He shared largely in the sufferings of the campaign against Quebec, and was taken prisoner there. After his exchange he raised a regiment in his own neighbourhood, and joining the Northern Army under General Gates, participated in the struggle with Burgoyne, and shares largely in the honour of that victory. It was said by an eye-witness that this was an exceedingly interesting and affecting event, and could not fail to satisfy every one of the high estimation in which the commander-in-chief held Colonel Bigelow. The American army was now watching the movements of Sir William Howe, commander of the British army, who soon landed his troops at the head of the Elk River in two columns, the right commanded by General Nyfausen, the left by Lord Cornwallis. After several skirmishes, the two armies met upon the banks of the Brandywine. In this battle the Americans were unsuccessful, and soon after the British army took possession of Philadelphia, and the American army took their position at Germantown, which is six miles northwest from Philadelphia. Here again the Americans are repulsed, and each army retires to winter quarters, the British to Philadelphia, the American to Valley Forge. Chapter 6. At Valley Forge Valley Forge is on the west side of Shulikil, twenty miles from Philadelphia, and this is where Colonel Bigelow spent the winter of 1777-78, with his regiment, and here is where the soldiers of freedom suffered most intensely. The British general had derived no other fruit from all his recent victories than of having procured excellent winter quarters for his army in Philadelphia. Here they spent the winter within the most splendid mansions of that city, feasting upon the best the country afforded, while the American army was suffering in their mud huts, half-clothed, with famine staring them in the face. Many of the soldiers were seen to drop dead with cold and hunger. Others had their bare feet cut by the ice, and left their tracks in blood. The American army exhibited in their quarters at Valley Forge such examples of constancy and resignation as were never paralleled before. In such pressing danger of famine and the dissolution of the army, mutiny appeared almost inevitable. At this alarming crisis, Colonel Bigelow had a party of officers and soldiers convene at his headquarters one evening, such a party as we should call in these days a surprise party. When the subject of abandoning the cause was fully discussed, Colonel Bigelow heard all that was to be said on the subject. Some of his men argued that Congress could not clothe or feed them, and they did not feel it to be their duty to abandon their families and homes to starve in that cold climate. When all had been said by as many as wished to express their minds, Colonel Bigelow arose and said, Gentlemen, I have heard all the remarks of discontent offered here this evening, but as for me, I have long since come to the conclusion to stand by the American cause, come what will. I have enlisted for life, I have cheerfully left my home and my family, all the friends I have are the friends of my country. I expect to suffer with hunger, with cold, and with fatigue, and, if need be, I expect to lay down my life for the liberty of these colonies. Such remarks as these could not fail of having the desired effect. About this time, a large herd of cattle was driven into the camp from New Jersey and Connecticut. Worcester had sent Colonel Bigelow's regiment sixty-two sets of shirts, shoes, and stockings as their proportion for the army. Other towns did their part. Worcester sent seventy-eight pounds in lawful money, which was taken up at the Old South Church after divine service. Now the Marquis de Lafayette, with his money and with his French troops, had arrived. Now Count de Siestang, with his powerful fleet, were in the American waters. Now General Gates, with his remainder of the Northern Army, had arrived to join the Army of Washington. Spring comes, and the day that the English abandon Philadelphia, the American Army leaves Valley Forge to watch their movements. They cross the Delaware to Coriel's Ferry, and take post at Hopewell. They do not venture to cross the Raritan. The English reach Allentown. General Lee occupies Englishtown, Washington encamped at Cranberry. Morgan and Colonel Bigelow are harassing the right flank of the English. The British, now upon the heights of Freehold, pass all their baggage to the hills of Middletown for safety, and then comes the Battle of Monmouth. Chapter 7. The Battle of Monmouth the Battle of Monmouth, so called by the Americans, was fought in Freehold, Monmouth County, New Jersey, situated thirty five miles southeast from Trenton. The commander in chief had detached two brigades to the support of General Wayne, who had been sent on as a vanguard and had already come up with the British rear. These two brigades were commanded by Generals Lee and Lafayette. 
At this time Colonel Bigelow was under the command of General Lafayette. This vanguard of the American army had so severely galled the rear of the British that General Clinton resolved to wheel his whole army and put the Americans to flight at the point of the bayonet. For a short time the conflict was severe. At length General Lee gave way, for which he was afterwards court-martialed and suspended for one year. The light horse also of Lafayette's brigade gave way, and nothing of that celebrated vanguard but Colonel Bigelow's regiment, with two or three other regiments, remained. It was said that if General Lee had stood his ground, as he might have done, a decisive victory would have been gained. Colonel Bigelow's regiment was the last to quit the field. It was said by one of Colonel Bigelow's men, who was an intimate acquaintance of the writer of this article, and who was wounded at that time, that, at the time he fell, Colonel Bigelow seized his musket from him, and fought more like a tiger than a man. This man was Mr. Solomon Parsons, whose son now occupies and owns the same farm on which his father died, on Apricot Street, in this city. Colonel Bigelow, with his regiment, had to retire, but was soon met by Washington with the main army, who was moving up to the rescue. After the troops of Lee and Lafayette had been rallied, the whole army turned upon the enemy, and then came the tug of war for Greek met Greek. The English flushed with their own advantages they had got, and the Americans under the command of their own beloved Washington, many of whom had never fought before by his side, were determined to retake the field or die in the attempt. The conflict was now terrible indeed, and in the midst of the flame and smoke and metal hail, Bigelow was conspicuous. The English were repulsed and driven to the woods. The Americans retake the field. Night comes on. The whole American army rest on their arms through the night that they may renew the attack with the dawn of day. Day comes on, and the British army has fled, as one of their officers said, by moonlight. But it so happened that the moon set that night at ten o'clock, being but four days old. Such was the issue of the Battle of Freehold, or of Monmouth, as the Americans call it. We have now traced the military history of Colonel Bigelow from April 19, 1775, to June 28, 1778. Chapter 8. The Slaughter at Wyoming the history of Colonel Bigelow is so interwoven with that of the Revolution that it is difficult to separate the two. We shall, therefore, give in this chapter a short account of the bloody butchery of the inhabitants of that beautiful little colony at Wyoming, and what Colonel Bigelow thought of that demonic cruelty, the bare remembrance of which makes us shudder. Wilkes Bar is a shire town of Luzerne County, PA. It is situated in the Wyoming Valley, 114 miles northeast from Harrisburg and 120 northwest from Philadelphia. This place was settled by emigrants from Connecticut in 1773 under the auspices of one Colonel De Key, who gave it the compound name it bears in honor of two eminent and zealous advocates of the American cause in the British Parliament, Wilkes and Barr. Wyoming contained eight townships, each containing a square of five miles, beautifully situated on both sides of the Susquehanna. Wilkes Bar is one of these towns. The inhabitants of this beautiful valley were much engaged in their country's cause, and nearly one thousand of their young men had joined the army, and were absent from home. Most of the remaining at home were Tories, although they were not so numerous as the Friends of Liberty. Yet they formed an alliance with the Indians, and the first of July there appeared before the fort at Wilkes Bar about sixteen hundred armed men, two-thirds of which were Tories and one-third Indians. The colony of Wyoming could muster only about five hundred men. In this condition the Tories and Indians fell upon them, and put them nearly all to death. Only about sixty escaped. Never was a rout so deplorable, never was a massacre accompanied with so many horrors. The barbarians took the men, women, and children promiscuously into houses and barracks, and set fire to them, and consumed them all, listening delighted to hear the moans and shrieks of the expiring multitude. The crops of every description were consigned to the flames. The habitations, granaries, and other constructions, the fruit of years of human industry, sunk in ruin under the destructive strokes of these cannibals. Their fury was also wrecked upon the very beasts. They cut out the tongues of the horses and cattle, and left them to wander in the midst of those fields lately so luxuriant, but now in desolation, to undergo the torments of a lingering death. Captain Bedlock was stripped naked, and stuck full of pine splinters and set on fire. Captains Ransom and Durgy were thrown alive into the fire. One of the Tories, whose mother had married a second husband, butchered her with his own hand, and then massacred his father-in-law, 
his own sisters, and their infants in the cradle. Another killed his own father, and exterminated all his family. A third imbued his hands in the blood of his brothers, his sisters, his brother-in-law, and his father-in-law. Other atrocities, if possible, still more abominable, we leave in silence. The Tories appeared to vie with, and even to surpass, the savages in barbarity. Such men as these Colonel Bigelow had to contend with in Worcester, in 1774, and upon hearing of this bloody massacre, it was said that Colonel Bigelow was filled with horror and indignation, and swore eternal vengeance and condign punishment upon all the Tories. Colonel Bigelow at this time was at his post in Rhode Island, and on hearing of this bloody tragedy, it was said by the same informant, that he walked his room for one hour without speaking. At length he exclaimed, Our worst enemies are those of our own household. CHAPTER Nine, SCOUTING After the British evacuated Rhode Island, Colonel Bigelow moves on with his regiment, and the next we hear of him he is at the Plank's Point. The American army was at this time very much divided. The great object of the commander-in-chief was to annoy the British forces as much as possible, and we think that it is not saying too much of Colonel Bigelow that no colonel in the whole American army was better qualified for that service. His whole life had been, and was at this time, devoted to his country's cause. He had left Worcester and all of its pleasant associations with a determination to free the colonies from the mother country, or die in the attempt. He seemed to feel that the whole responsibility of the struggle rested on him. Always ready to obey orders from superior officers cheerfully, and never wanting in energy to execute them. The deep snows of Quebec had not cooled his ardour, and the fetid stench of the English prison ship could not abate his love of liberty and country. The blood and carnage of Saratoga and of Monmouth had given him confidence. The blood-stained soil of Valley Forge had inured him to the hardships to which others would have yielded. The news of the bloody butchery at Wyoming had aroused his iron nerve to its utmost tension against Tories, and in this condition he was ordered with his regiment to Robinson's Farm, New Jersey. Here he breaks up a nest of Tories, who were supplying the British with hay, grain, and other things necessary for their army. An anecdote of this bloodless battle was related to the writer by one of Colonel Bigelow's men, who was present at the time. The English had sent a company of men to guard their teams while removing some hay they were receiving from their friends the Tories, when Colonel Bigelow came up with his regiment and ordered them to disperse. The Tories were insolent. The English captain refused to go until the hay went with them. Upon this, Colonel Bigelow ordered a part of his men to fire upon them. At this moment, one of Colonel Bigelow's men from Worcester, who had just joined the regiment, and we are sorry to say was a coward, exclaimed at the top of his voice, In the name of God, why don't Colonel Bigelow order us to retreat? This man in after life received a pension from government, and died respected a few years since in this city. His children are now living here, and therefore we shall not call his name. He was always afraid of gunpowder. The English were also frightened and fled, leaving the hay on the hands of Colonel Bigelow, who, having no use for it, returned it to its Tory owner, on the express condition that he should not sell it to the British. Colonel Bigelow is now ordered to Peerskill. This is a town on the Hudson, 46 miles north of New York, and 106 miles south of Albany. Here he frightened the Tories, and drove the British down the river to New York, Colonel Bigelow is again at the Planks and Stony Point, guarding the pass called King's Ferry. General Clinton moves upon them with the British army, and Commodore Collier, with the British squadron, ascends the river. The British storm the fort, named the Fort of Lafayette, at the Planks. The fortress has to surrender, but not until Colonel Bigelow showed them the points of his bayonets. It was said of this conflict that Colonel Bigelow ordered his men to draw their charge and approach the enemy with fixed bayonets, while he himself laid aside his sword and took a musket from a sick soldier, and with it fought more like a tiger than a man. This fort, being overpowered by the enemy, at length gave way and surrendered at discretion. The policy of the English is now to resume the war of devastation, and the army is ordered into South Carolina. General Gates is ordered to the command of the Southern Army. Chapter 10 Disasters at the South General Gates takes command of the Southern Army. The British at this time had almost undisputed possession of South Carolina, Georgia, and North Carolina. In this condition Gates resolved to risk a general battle with Lord Cornwallis, and for which he was severely blamed. He lost the battle, 
hence the blame if on the other hand he had gained it he would have gained another laurel to place by the side of the one gained at saratoga at this battle general gates lost more than two thousand men and among them three valuable officers general gregory was killed and baron de kalb and general rutherford of carolina were taken prisoners this was the result of the battle of camden at this time colonel bigelow was watching the movements of the british troops in new york connecticut and rhode island in this stage of the narrative the writer cannot refrain from passing a tribute of respect to the memory of these patriotic women of south carolina who displayed so ardent so rare a love of country that scarcely could there be found in ancient or modern history an instant more worthy to excite surprise and admiration they repaired on board ships and descended into dungeons where their husbands children or friends were in confinement they carried with them consolation and encouragement summon your magnanimity they said yield not to the fury of tyrants hesitate not to prefer prisons to infamy death to servitude america has fixed her eyes upon her beloved defenders you will reap doubt it not the fruit of your sufferings they will produce liberty that parent of all blessing they will shelter her forever from the assaults of british banditti you are the martyrs of a cause the most grateful to heaven and sacred to man by such words these generous women mitigated the miseries of the unhappy prisoners exasperated at their constancy the english condemned the most zealous of them to banishment and confiscation in bidding a last farewell to their fathers their children their brothers their husbands these heroines far from betraying the least mark of weakness which in men might have been excused extorted them to arm themselves with intrepidity they conjured them not to allow fortune to vanquish them nor to suffer the love they bore their families to render them unmindful of all they owed their country a supernatural alacrity seemed to animate them when they accompanied their husbands into distant countries and even when they immured themselves with them in their fetid ships into which they were inhumanly crowded reduced to the most frightful indigence they were seen to beg bread for themselves and families among those who were nurtured in the lap of opulence many passed suddenly from the most delicate and most elegant style of living to the rudest toils and to the humblest services the humiliation could not triumph over their resolution and cheerfulness their example was a support to their companions in misfortune to this heroism of the women of carolina it is principally to be imputed that the love and even the name of liberty were not totally extinguished in the southern provinces colonel bigelow hearing of the loss of gates army and the appointment of general green to the command of the southern department solicited and received orders from the commander-in-chief to move on with his regiment to join green but did not arrive in season to participate in the battles of hobkirk and of uchu springs which closed the campaign in the south chapter eleven battle at yorktown yorktown is a port of entry in virginia seventy miles east southeast from richmond on the south side of york river opposite gloucester the british army from the south had encamped at this place and fortified it colonel bigelow had arrived with his regiment to join general green colonel bigelow is now in general lafayette's detachment lafayette's second officer is colonel hamilton aide-de-camp of the commander-in-chief a young man of the highest expectations and accompanied by colonel lorenz son of the former president of congress another detachment was commanded by the baron de vionsnit the count charles de damas and the count de dupont the commanders addressed their soldiers a short exhortation to inflame their courage they represented that this last effort would bring them to the close of their glorious toils the attack was extremely impetuous general lafayette is ordered to attack the right redoubt while the baron de Vyomsnit is to attack the left this was done at the point of the bayonet suffice it to say that both redoubts were carried one of colonel bigelow's men on being inquired of by the writer where his colonel was at the time answered why old colonel tim was everywhere all the time and you would thought if you had been there that there was nobody else in the struggle but colonel bigelow and his regiment before the morning of the nineteenth those redoubts were all repaired and manned by the allies now comes the celebrated nineteenth day of october seventeen eighty one the day began to appear the allies opened a tremendous fire from all their batteries the bombs showered copiously the french fleet under command of count de grasse are opening a most deadly fire from the harbour 
Lord Cornwallis sends in a flag to General Washington, proposing a cessation of arms for twenty-four hours. Washington would not consent to it, and would grant but two hours. And during this interval he should expect the propositions of the British commander. The proposition is made and accepted. The British flotilla, consisting of two frigates, the Guadalupe and the Fowey, besides about twenty transports, twenty others had been burnt during the siege, one hundred and sixty pieces of field artillery, mostly brass, with eight mortars, more than seven thousand prisoners, exclusive of seamen, five hundred and fifty slain, including one officer, Major Cochrane, were surrendered into the hands of the armies of France and America, whose loss was about four hundred and fifty in killed and wounded. At the news of so glorious, so important a victory, transports of exultation broke out from one extremity of America to the other. Nobody dared longer to doubt of independence. A poet in Colonel Bigelow's regiment made a short song commemorative of this event, in which occurred these lines. Count de Grassy, he lies in the harbour, and Washington is on shore. A wag in Worcester, after they had returned, changed it so as to make it read thus, Count de Grassy, he lies in the harbour, and Bigelow is on shore. Such was the end of the campaign of Virginia, which was well nigh being that of the American War. This laid the foundation of a general peace. Thus ended a long and arduous conflict in which Great Britain expended an hundred million of money with an hundred thousand lives and won nothing. The United States endured great cruelty and distress from their enemies, lost many lives and much treasure, but finally delivered themselves from a foreign dominion and gained a rank among the nations of the earth. Chapter 12 close of the revolution after the surrender of yorktown the american army divide part of the troops returned to the banks of the hudson to watch the motions of clinton who had still a large force at new york the rest were sent to south carolina to reinforce general green and confirm the authority of congress in those provinces colonel bigelow and his regiment were among those that returned to the hudson the marquis de lafayette embarked about the same time for europe bearing with him the affection of the whole American people. In a few months General Greene had driven the British from the southern colonies, and they retired to New York to join the main army. Colonel Bigelow is ordered to leave West Point, where he was stationed, and proceed to Rhode Island. The next spring, 1782, Sir Guy Carleton arrived in America and took command of the British army at New York. Immediately after his arrival, he acquainted General Washington and Congress that negotiations for a peace had been commenced at Paris. On the 30th of November of that year, the provincial articles of peace were signed. Colonel Bigelow returned to Worcester, but was very soon stationed at West Point, for what purpose the writer could never ascertain. Afterwards, he was assigned to the command of the National Arsenal at Springfield. After his term of service was out there, he returned again to Worcester, with a frame physically impaired by long hardship, toil and exposure, with blighted worldly prospects, with the remains of private property, considerable at the outset, seriously diminished by the many sacrifices of his martial career. In 1780, Colonel Bigelow, with others, obtained a grant of 23,040 acres of land in Vermont, and founded a town on which was bestowed the name of Montpellier, now the capital of the state. A severe domestic affliction in 1787, the loss of his second son, Andrew, uniting with other disappointments, depressed his energy, and cast over his mind a gloom, presaging the approach of night of premature old age. He died March 31st, 1790, in the fifty-first year of his age. End of Reminiscences of the Military Life and Sufferings of Colonel Timothy Bigelow, Commander of the 15th Regiment of the Massachusetts Line in the Continental Army during the War of the Revolution, 1812-1814.